Okay, so last week we talked about Genesis 1-1, and we got through actually the first three words of the, the sentence, which is in the beginning, God, okay? And then um, I, I thought I was done with Genesis 1-1, and I'm really not, and then Jay asked something this morning, which would help to, uh, uh, oh, and just so you know, I videotaped this, and the questions make it a lot more interesting, so just, you know, get involved, and... Uh, uh, I had somebody actually sit and watch the whole thing. I, I can't imagine the boredom that he went through, but he's out in Washington and he watched the whole thing. So the questions do help. But um, what we have here is the first sentence of the Bible in Hebrew. And I, it's very bad handwriting, so any Jewish person would read that and they'd be like, well, I know, I can. So it says, Bereshit bara elchim et Hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. And I'm just going to break this down just so that you can see it in Hebrew. I don't want you to learn this or think about it and, you know, confuse yourself. But be, this, is, this means in. Like if I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm, I'm uh, be Yerushalayim is what I would say I, in Jerusalem. Okay, so be is in. And then reshit is the beginning. We talked about that last week. Rosh is, means the head or the first, like Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so Bereshit, and then you have Bara. Now, this is a word that is almost exclusively used. I believe it's only applied uh, when it says created pertaining to God. Okay, there are other types of, it'll say he created this and that, but this is when God creates. And it's only used a certain number of times in the Bible, not many. And um, it, I think the last time it's used in the Bible is in Jeremiah where it says the Lord will create a new thing. Uh, a woman will uh, encompass a man. A anyway, it's kind of a hard uh, verse to uh, read, but I think that's the last time this word is used. But bara is an act of creation. It's actually God taking something from nothing and making something. So bara. All right. Now, this is kind of interesting because you know the name of... Uh, I, I may have addressed this, I may not have. In Hebrew and Aramaic, you have uh, two different words. Ben is son in Hebrew, and Bar is son in Aramaic. Okay, Bar, uh, Barabbas, for example, the son of Abbas, or uh, what's his name, uh, Bar, you, you'll see Bar many, yeah, well, Ben, her, that's right, so the son of her, that's what that means. So this is just kind of a fun little thing that, that uh, I heard some Jewish people talking about, is this is bara. Well, A is the first letter in the alphabet, and if you had that thing I gave you last week, it'll, it'll say it's the first, it's the symbol of power, etc. Uh, some people say that uh, it, it pertains to God, okay? So this would be the son of God created, okay? Created the son of God. Anyway, so it's just kind of a neat thing. Bar, son, of the creator, okay? I just heard some peop Jewish people talking about that. I'm not saying it's correct. I'm just saying it's kind of interesting. And then you have Elohim, all right? Now, I am at the end of a word in Hebrew is plural, okay? So if you have the word Ephrat would be fruit or fruitful, and then you have Ephraim, which is the name of one of the sons of Israel, it would mean like twice fruitful or very bountiful, right? Do you understand that? Im. So if you have, um, right, here's the word Hashemayim, that means the heavens, plural, okay? Well, Im at the end of God, Elohim. El is God. Anytime you see El in there, it means God. So Elohim means plural. Is that right? Do we have more than one God? Well, that doesn't imply the Trinity, and that's why I want people to be careful, because people will apply this to the Trinity, okay? This word, Elohim, is called a majestic noun, I believe. I, 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 I may be wrong in that, but it's a majestic. And what that means is this O in here, Elohim, O would be up here, Elohim, shows a fullness, Okay, it does not specifically mean a trinity or that you can get the trinity out of this. But some people will try to apply that. And I'm telling you that just simply so that when people make that argument, you could say, well, yeah, it's possible, but it doesn't prove it. Because Jewish people have been reading this for a billion years and they just don't believe in the trinity, right? So just so you understand, this is a majestic noun or a, there's a term, majestic something. Anyway, so it, it, it does mean God and there is one God in the Bible. That's what we're... Anybody have any idea what that was? Huh, okay, well. All right, so just so you know about that Elohim. Elohim is the most common term for God in the Bible. 
it's like 3,000 or 4,000 times the name Elohim is used. Yes? Is that, uh, is that applicable to let us make man in our image Elohim? Well, yes. Uh, no. I, I, I'm not sure. Okay? There, there's a lot of debate over that. So I say yes, I say no, and then I'm not sure because different people will read that differently. Now, some Jewish people will actually read that, and they'll see that, and they'll say, you know, I've never been told that, and they come to Christ because it makes them question things. I don't know the answer to that because, like I said, I've read different commentaries, and some will say yes. That that shows that there is a Trinity in that because it is. It's it's a plural in that case, and it's not talking about God, you know, like this being a majestic. Let us make God man in our image. It's referring to something more than just. A single, you know what I mean? So, yes and no, because the Jewish rabbis will somehow dismiss that, and I don't know how. Okay? But you're right. Okay? Uh, I, I, I can't go any deeper than that. All right. The next one is an interesting word. It's et. Okay? Now, normally this isn't translated at all. Uh, in the beginning, uh, created Elohim, or God, et Hashemayim. This is working towards this word. Okay? He created the heavens, but it's like, I, 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 there's nothing that we have comparable to it. However, this word, which we'll get into at a different time when Cain was named, has a specific meaning because it can also mean with. And there are two words that uh, uh, can be translated with with. One is im and one is et. And the naming of Cain demonstrates something really unbelievable. I can't wait till the day we get there. It, it really is unbelievable. So anyway, et. Now, one interesting thing about the word et, I told you this before, is that the ancient Hebrew is different, and you've got that chart. The ancient Hebrew would look like this. And terrible drawing, Charlie, I know, but it would, we'll call that a, a, a bull's head, I, okay? And then this one would be a cross, okay? That's what et would have originally looked like. Now this is, I believe that these original letters are there divinely inspired by God, and they point to things. And as I said, I do believe that the Tav is the cross. That's uh, Ezekiel 9 makes that clear when it says, go through the city and put the Tav on people's heads. It is the cross that saves. Anyway, and we talked about this. You may not have been here, but uh, uh, in Ezekiel 9, he's about to destroy the city. The Lord comes into the city, and he's about to destroy the city. And he um, says to one of the people with a riding horn on his side, he says, go throughout the city and put a mark. A tav. It's only translated mark in uh, English Bibles, but it says, go put a mark throughout the city on anybody who mourns and weeps over what's happening. And then he tells five other people, go and just kill everybody else. Just kill them. And so, but the mark is the Hebrew word tav, which is spelled tav, which is the letter with a vav, which is this right here, but together they spell tav, which means mark, okay? But the tav, which is the same pronunciation is this alone and this and this is a cross. So he went through the city and he actually put a cross on the forehead of everybody. The cross saves, and this is throughout the Bible, okay? Now, interestingly enough, this is seven words in the first sentence of the Bible, okay? The middle word is et. I, man, I wish that would stop. Hey, somebody's phone interfering with the speaker. Well, that's off. It says don't turn it off, but it's off. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> the, this here, interestingly enough, what is, the, what is Jesus called on the last page of the Bible? He's called it a couple times in the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha. Alpha and the Omega. Okay? Right in the first sentence of the Bible, you have the same designation. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav is the last. So the Alpha and the Omega, or the A and the Z, some English Bibles translate it, or the Hebrew Alpha and Tav, Aleph and Tav, are there in the first sentence of the Bible, in the middle of the first sentence of the Bible. That's kind of neat curiosity. And then if you take this, and I can't wait till we get to Levit Leviticus 16, because this right here, well, it'll be a while, but that right here, the ancient, the paleographic, or pa yeah, paleographic Hebrew, points to what we talked about in class yesterday. Remember the two goats, and then the high priest sacrificing for his own sin? This actually points to that. In Leviticus 16, he is required to sacrifice what for himself? I said this yesterday. A bull. Okay? What is the high priest a picture of? What, is, what does he picture? In ancient Israel, he pictures something. It's the same answer every time. So just, no, 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 no. Everything in the Old Testament pictures something. It's always the same answer. 
Jesus. Okay, there we go. The high priest, Jesus is in Hebrews, our great high priest, right? Okay, so the high priest is Jesus. All right, now, the high priest needs to sacrifice for his own sins on the Day of Atonement before he sacrifices for the sins of the people. What does he sacrifice? He sacrifices a bull. So there, at the middle of the first sentence of the Bible, is a bull and a cross. Jesus is pictured as a bull. He doesn't sacrifice for his own sins because he's sinless, but he is pictured as the bull. Do you see what's happening? So you have a bull on the cross. Interestingly enough, this here, Aleph, this is how we would spell Aleph, and you can ask a Jewish person to, to do this and they'll agree with you. Okay? Well, they will. If you, if you take them through these things, they will start to see this. I talked to one, I, I witnessed to a Jewish guy that worked at the mall one day, he was from Israel, and I talked to him and I said, what does Aleph backwards spell? Oh, it spells this. Pela. And he figured it out in his Hebrew mind, right? Pela. What is Jesus called in Isaiah 9? He shall be called the... He shall be called the wonderful wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, right? Pela. Pele Yoetz is what he would be, the wonderful counselor. Wonderful. Aleph backwards is wonderful. So you have the wonderful cross right there in the middle of the first sentence of the Bible. Okay? Isn't that amazing? And then if you take the word Tav and you spell that backwards, it would spell Ve-et, which is this word right here, which is just saying and the wonderful cross. This means and and the wonderful cross, and the one, so it's like a, a palindrome where it goes around and around, never ends. The wonderful cross, I don't care what anybody says, that is a correct analysis of the Bible. God did make a mistake, and I'm not misreading that, and I figured this out one day while I was cleaning the parking lot one Monday morning. This, this is where I do all of my thinking, and when you talk to a Jewish person, now you ask them that, and they will stand there, and they will understand this, but they won't understand the Paleo-Hebrew until they actually study it. Oh, that's what they'll do, just, just like a Jehovah's Witness will say, I need to go talk to the elder, instead of checking for themselves, they will, ex that's exactly right though. But this is all going on in this first sentence of the Bible, and as I said, we could go on with this for, for days and days, but this is just some highlights I'm giving you. All right, next we have, um, let me erase all of that. All right, we have the wonderful cross, and we've got the wonderful cross, and all of that in the middle of the first sentence of the Bible. And then we have ha, just so you know this, and it's not a big deal, but ha means the, okay? So we have in, beginning, created, Elohim. This is going towards this word, the, and then shemaim. Remember, im is plural, so we have the heavens, okay? And then we have ve means and, et, same thing, towards this, ha, the Eretz, the earth. So that's your first sentence of the Bible in a nutshell. Won't spend any more time on it, but I hope you enjoyed that little breakdown of the first sentence of the Bible. Jay asked about creation. So last week we got through, in the beginning, created God. Okay, and how do we know that this is the God that we're talking about? He's perfectly simple, he doesn't have parts and all that kind of stuff. All right, what did he create? Okay, he created the heavens and the earth. Einstein proved that time, space, and matter all form a continuum. We talked about that. Okay, so uh, from that point, oh, before I get into this, I want you to go, somebody go to John, I wrote this down a moment ago. Somebody go to John 8, uh, 58, I think it is, and then somebody else go to Luke 20, 38. And maybe we'll read a couple of verses before each one to set it up. But John 8, go to John 8, and then somebody else go to Luke 20, and when you get there, we'll read, read some. Okay, Luke 20. Now, go down and just start in like 35 or something. I want to get to 38 is where I want to get to. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the li living, for to him all are alive. For to him all are alive. Do you remember last week when I gave you that, that thing and I said, here's Charlie and here's David. Charlie is future to David. David is past to Charlie. And this is all one continuum that started at a point. And all of this is open to God all the time because he's the creator. All of this is apart from him. He sees everything all at once. 